in literature because what's the point of reading a book where nothing, where, where not anything can happen? If you know that the plot of the book is going to be constrained by the here and the now, I find these books boring. I'd much rather read a book where anything could happen, where, where aliens could drop down out of the sky or magic could suddenly start working. And so by using these literary techniques of imagination and uh, application of science, we can illuminate the human condition in ways that ordinary literature cannot. We can make the human condition bigger and stranger to make things more interesting and comment on life in ways that mimetic literature cannot. Thank you. Jeff? Well, science fiction, of course, is the literature of our hopes and our fears and also our dreams. It's in many ways the literature of the possible. It's a way of our exploring what is and what isn't possible. John W. Campbell used to edit one of the great science fiction magazines of the past, uh, <laughs> Astounding Stories. And uh, he actually renamed it. Astounding in its way, that just that name for it, does encapsulate one of the things that science fiction does, is it gives you that sense of wonder. Uh, really, a good science fiction story really makes you say, wow. Uh, if you haven't seen the concept before, when you, you know, first read Larry Niven's book, Ring World, and you get, just first get the approach of what it is that he has built, you say, wow, that's cool. So astounding is, is a legitimate goal of science fiction. But Sean W. Campbell actually changed the name of his magazine. He changed it to Analog. Partly this was because Analog was a, more of a late 20th century name and not an early 20th century name. You know, Astounding did have that sort of smell of the 1930s. Uh, but also he did it sort of deliberately because he said, well, science fiction gives us a way of playing with analog futures. We can make the future, we can create it and see what it's like and see what it would be like to live there. So it's a, really an analog of, of moving into the future. Hugo Gernsback, the very first science fiction editor, uh, he started amazing stories uh, after other things like Electrical Experimenter magazine. Uh, in fact, thought of science fiction explicitly as a didactic literature. This was a literature to inspire young people and make them learn about science. But when you actually read that science fiction of the 1920s and the 1930s, you say, man, if they learned about science from that science fiction, what they learned may not have been exactly right. And I have to say, I had to unlearn a lot of the science that I learned from science fiction when I was a kid. But still, that is another purpose of science fiction. It's a literature of possibilities. It's a literature of inspiration because it shows us what might be possible. And in the flip sense, it shows us things that might be possible that we don't want. Certainly, science fiction novels like 1984 uh, are novels that show us paths into futures that may not be the path that we want to take. But at its best, science fiction shows us that the universe is very big. There's a lot out there. Uh, there's places to go, people to see, things to do. Uh, it's a wonderful universe, and we should go out there and explore it. Thank you. Doctor? Yeah. Um, well, certainly th there's various uh, kinds of works that are all lumped in as science fiction, and some are satire, and some are, uh, uh, you know, horror, and this and that. But to me, um, the real science fiction that is uh, worth discussing as such um, is this stuff that attempts to enable you to see with your mind what has not yet been seen by anyone's eyes. Um, and, and there's an inner truth in it. Um, I mean, let me take an example of um, 
some pretty influential science fiction, which on the surface is completely unrealistic. And that would be the uh, John Carter novels, of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Okay. And of course, this was a vision of a civilization on Mars that was based on the astronomical findings of Percival Lowell, uh, which were uh, at least accepted among the popular press at that time, uh, of the Mars of the Canals. And so Edgar Rice Burroughs took the Mars of the Canals and he populated it with uh, um, an extremely interesting combination of civilizations which he described in great detail, even down to the rules of their version of chess. Um, and uh, now, you might say that both Lowell and um, uh, Burroughs were completely wrong. We saw that with Mariner 4. There were no canals on Mars and certainly no, uh, you know, cities of red men with flying battleships and, you know, um, the Tharks and Warhoons, you know, uh, uh, roaming the plains on six-legged boats. And, the, um, and yet there's an inner truth there. Because what he made clear to his readers was the idea that there are other worlds. Um, that, you know, most people, even though they know academically that the Earth is a planet and there are nine planets in this solar system and probably lots of others in other solar systems, they nevertheless think of their actual mental map of reality is that this is the world and this other stuff is in the sky. Um, that is, they, uh, they ha people in their hearts actually maintain a geocentric view and that's why even educated people say the sun rises and so forth. Um, the, the, and yet that's not true. What is true is that the universe is filled with worlds and uh, undoubtedly on others, various civilizations and so forth. And it's a gigantic place uh, filled with innumerable possibilities. And, and Burroughs made that real um, in the imagination. So there is that. And then the, finally there's another thing, which is here we are, I mean the science fiction takes off as humanity approaches and enters the space age. And, 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 and it is most emblematically about space. That's why, even though not all science fiction novels are about space, the science fiction award today is a rocket ship. And uh, it is the symbol of science fiction, is this, this the rocket um, that's going to go into space and see what's out there. And um, in a way, to me, um, When I was a, a little boy, the two literature that I loved was, on the one hand, science fiction, and on the other hand, Homer. And uh, the Odyssey, in its own way, is science fiction. And, uh, and it's about the man who is going to travel into the unknown and encounter all sorts of dangers and menaces, but he can conquer them all by developing his mind. Okay. His ally is Athena against Poseidon, his enemy. Okay, the goddess of practical wisdom and strategy against the forces of the elements. And you know, this was written at a time when the Greeks were first becoming maritime and were about to go out into the Mediterranean and who knows what they would find out there. But Homer is saying, if you develop your mind, you can take them on. And Heinlein is saying, if a kid has a slide rule and he has mastered his survival skills from his experience in the Boy Scouts and is self-reliant and, you know, has got us into, he can take on any bunch of stupid aliens and things. And, and the, um, and, and I think that's a very healthy message. And, and uh, uh, it's a message of, of, of uh, a civilization that, believes in itself and believes in developing its minds and, and, and is ready to take on new challenges. And, and I think that science fiction in, in, in its healthy form is ultimately about that. Um, I'll leave it there. Mary? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Human progress is driven by technology. Uh, Jeff and I went to a 
the Cleveland Art Museum, and we were looking through the armor room. And if you go through in the clockwise direction, which is what they want you to, you see how armor developed over a period of time, and you can just see that that's technology. It has a lot to do with metallurgy. It has a lot to do with understanding um, how swords hit helmets. And if you think about the history of warfare, it's a history of technology. The technologically superior have always been able to win out over the technologically less advanced. This is only one way in which technology has driven human progress or human existence. Maybe there are some things we're not progress. So if we talk about science fiction, it's a literature about the intersection of human beings with technological envelop developments. That's what it's about. It's about human beings encountering technological difficulties or technological advances and how this impacts their lives and the problems and the, the way they solve these problems and the way they use technologies to solve these problems. And personally, I can't think of anything more important than that in literature. I mean, I think it's all very well to explore the human heart, but I think the human heart is attached to a human brain. And I think that's what science fiction looks at. Now, um, I think science fiction is a literature of ideas. There's a lot of ways in which our period of time in terms of literature is related to the 18th century when, uh, and a lot of people don't like 18th century literature, but it's, it, that too was a period when people were looking at ideas. They wanted, they turned to literature to exercise their minds, to make them think, not just to get a good crying spell in. <clears throat> uh, the word didactic was used with regard to science fiction, and I think some science fiction is didactic, but I don't think that's what it's meant to be, because I think if you give a child a book of science fiction and tell him that he's supposed to learn science from it, I think there's, no matter how good it is or who wrote it, he is going to get some wrong ideas. You know, there are children in this country, many children in this country, who think we have already traveled to these stars, and this is a mistake. That's not what science fiction is intended to do. It's intended to get people to think. And that's why, that's why it's important, I think. The other thing is I think it's a literature of optimism. And uh, mostly, mostly there are pessimistic science fiction uh, stories and novels and even movies. Because it's a literature that posits the idea that we're going to have a future, and not only are we going to have a future, but the future is going to be driven by human ingenuity, and that people that try hard enough, and that think hard enough, and are clever enough, are going to prevail, and that humanity will prevail over whatever problems it has through intelligence and through ingenuity, and that's why I think science fiction is important. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, Pass it all the way down to David again. <laughs> Second question. Why should Mars be featured in science fiction? Well, it's clear if you look at the history of the field that Mars has been featured in science fiction. Um, so if, if, the question, if the question is why has that been so, then because it's the most obvious target of the, of the science fictional imagination, it's the next place to go once you get off of the Earth, um, there have been plenty of fictional voyages to the moon, but I think even from here we can see that the moon is, is dead. Um, you can see that it's all mountains and you can't see any seas. I mean, they thought they, thought they maybe could see some seas, but the earliest telescopes revealed that, Mar that the moon was not as interesting. But Mars, by virtue of being farther away, is more mysterious and has a lot more, a lot more potential. So we've known for a long time that Mars was accessible, more accessible.